what we got here is a little presentation on gauges because everybody needs to know about gauges and things. You know, everybody ever had trouble with a gauge? What happened to your gauge? Uh, Tell me your story. Uh, the, um, it was in my mom's 2010, I think Malibu, and how should I this? Like the the meter dropped. Like it didn't stop working, but it would never go over like 10 miles per hour or nothing. Mm -hmm. And then like when the mechanic checked, whatever it said, like, everything looked fine, but yeah, something wrong with like the spring or something. Okay, you talking about the speedometer? Yeah. Okay, I got you. That's pretty cool. I guess I was going to use yeah. my phone for a clicker here. I'm not sure what else had that in my head for. Anyway, the voice motometer had a little alcohol thermometer in it. It was one of the top of the radiator. And it patented in 1912. And the people, that, they looked like a hood ornament out there. But you could drive down the road, you could watch to see if your temperature would get, you know. And back in those days, back in the Model A days, there wasn't a water pump on the car. It just boiled uh, the... Uh, Cool it up and it went down through the radiator and it went in the bottom and it just kind of circled around. <laughs> it was a whole other different thing. And the fuel tank was, it was gravity feed. The fuel tank was right in front of the windshield. Had a good place to put it. Okay, now, from, uh, from then to the late 20s, the Boyce Motor Leader Company, founded in 1912 by a German immigrant, Hermann Schleich, manufactured a variety of different models that varied in size and design. Hey, hey. yeah, you want brakes looked at, right? Yeah. yeah. The reason I need to come in your fleet, right? It was yeah, well, uh, what I do to do is make you, uh, what kind of vehicle you got? Uh, Tahoe. A Tahoe, okay. Uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, bring it in, throw it up, pull the wheels off and look at the things, but uh, we'll start on it at like one, are you going to be here for a while today? Yeah, I'll leave it at 4.30. Okay, that's fine. Just bring it back at one and we'll get you hooked up. Okay. All right, that work? Uh -huh. Thank All right. you. All right, so... Uh, now, now these uh, thermal siphon cooling systems, that's what this was. See, a little, see how it, the... You can see by the way the head, that head's made, you know, whenever it just percolate that water up through there and then it come back down. And that's back in the day, you know. Uh, so here we got Dodge Brothers had a dashboard that was really a little more advanced. See that? That was an advanced dashboard. Uh, they had oil pressure, they had amps, and they basically had this uh, 60 mile an hour speedometer. <laughs> you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the little cars, you know, they would really quick and look. And whenever you got 10,000 miles on one of these cars, you had to put rings in it. I mean, that's how, much, that's how often you had to work on them. Back in the 1960s, if you got 100,000 miles out of a car, man, you had a good car. I ain't kidding you. If it was a car that was made in the 60s, you know, you'd usually get more 100,000 out of it. Wow. Every 12,000 miles, you put points and plugs in it. You know, we're talking about two put two ups and stuff like that. Now, years, down the years, measured voltage drop across the resistor. It's basically how they would work. There's a little shunt there. And the gauge was marked amp, but in the late 70s, volt meters replaced amp meters. And that confused people. An amp meter required a heavier wire than a volt meter, though, because the current's basically got to flow through that shunt, you know? All right, so this right here is a bimetal gauge. A bimetal gauge is that little voltage regulator that they have up on the dash, and what it would do is it would feed a little blinking signal in there to that gauge, and the more ground that came from the sending unit, the more that little heater operated, and that little heater would change that little bimetal strip. What bimetal is, is two kinds of metal or a different kind of metal, and they're uh, married to each other, and one of them expands faster than the other one, so it'll always change shape with heat. You got it? And so you notice this little heating wire wrapped around it, and ground it, that's a chintzy looking rig, isn't it? So basically this little thing right here, would uh, send a little pulsating weak voltage signal in there. And whenever I was working on one of those, what I would do is I'd get a test light and hook it to the ground. And I'd come on in here, no one. I'd get a test light and hook it, for, hook it to the ground. And then I would unplug the sending unit with a key on. I would go to that sending unit wire. And if I saw my test light pulsing, if I saw it pulsing, I'd know that the voltage regulator was sending the voltage out there, that the wire was good. See, if you unplug the wire from a gauge sending unit, if it's one of the, unless it's one of those that's driven by the engine controller or whatever, and on those you can actually can put test with scan tool. You basically are going to hook your test light to test light to ground and go into that, you know, just touch it into the, you unplug your sending unit and see if it makes the gauge operate. So that's telling you basically that the wire is good all the way to the gauge. What if you do that and the gauge doesn't respond and you don't see any indication? So even on a magnetic gauge, you're still going to see the test light bulb glowing real dim. Uh, some gauge, most gauges, if you sh if you unplug them, they go back to the cold or the empty or the low side. On a gas gauge, if you unplug it, it goes all the way past full. Yeah, unless it's one of those that's driven by a microprocessor, so on and so forth. 
All right, so bench test, but some of these are on the way, and you'll burn it up in short order. Uh, Mr. Uh, Marshall brought this uh, gas gauge out of the 65 uh, Galaxy that they were working on over there blowing him. And he says, uh, can you test this gauge? And he was real serious all the time, and the guy that was with him, you know, was real nervous because this is a big boss man and all that. He said, yeah, Mr. Marshall, I can test it, but if I let the smoke out of it, it won't work anymore. He says, let the smoke out. What does that mean? Well, it's got this magic smoke in there, and I was trying to, you know, just jerking his chain. And the guy that was other employee, was, he, he's kidding, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> he scared him to death. He's afraid he'll get in trouble. But I mean, the thing about it was, you can burn them suckers up. If you put power and ground to that thing, that needle will go all the way over there, and a bunch of magic smoke will come out of this little thing. Now, that's in your older vehicles, you know, that you're going to have. They didn't actually uh, uh, have the bimetal gauge in the ones after about. I think Ford still had some bimetal gauges in the in the mid 80s, but most of them had gone magnetic, is what it amounted to. Yeah, there's your temp sender, fuel sender, whatever happens with using bimetal gauges, and there's your little heat and coil and your bimetallic arm. It's like a little turn signal flasher almost. All right, so on bimetal gauges, you ground the sender, drives the temperature, and the gauge is high. And so that's what I do is taking a test light on there and all that. So uh, now the high end cars went digital. These gave the same information, but they were sexier. The wiring was always similar. Check your schematic. Always look at that. You see these fancy, you know, space age looking things and all that. So this is a, uh, this is basically LED, and that is a, a different kind. I used to know the name of that. Not really. It's like whatever you're trying to think of it. Um, I ain't gonna say it. I ain't gonna worry about that. Just move on. That's another LED one, but it's got to be backlit. That's like a Thunderbird, like a, uh, you know, uh, 84 Thunderbird. Well, they came out with some of those. All this was LED, a light emitting node, not LED, I'm sorry, vacuum fluorescent was the other one. And this one right here was um, liquid crystal. I mean, that's what I meant. So that's liquid crystal this way. I can tell uh, Kayla's about to go to sleep over there. All right. Now then, you got to be careful with the old ones. On these old Jeeps over here, when I, one time I had the instrument cluster out of one of these suckers. And what I didn't realize was the ground for the gauges is where it bolts into the dash. Right? The gauges were grounded that way. I had the thing out of the dash, and I turned on the key, and every gauge in that sucker went all the way to hot, and smoke went out, went all the way back down. I fried a whole set of gauges. That ain't the way it was on the other car I ever saw, but on that Jeep, if you ain't got that thing bolted to the dash and you turn on the key, there's no ground for the instrument voltage regulator, and it just basically had straight voltage in there, and it went all the way over, and it was over. It was done. Now, on speedometers, back in the day, you had this little drum, and it's a magnet, and the speedometer cable spins that magnet, and that drum's got a little weak spring, and it's the needles over here, and it's basically as that magnet spins inside that drum, that drum tries to follow it, right? And all I used to see sometimes is that place where that little, that post actually sets down in the, into that cable shaft, and it had a little bronze bushing in there, and every now and then, that little bronze bushing little, would start to get little powdery elements of that bronze, would go down there and start grabbing that little needle, and it would, it would be sitting right down in here, and it would try to catch that needle, and you'd be driving along, and all of a sudden your speedometer is going, wow, 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 wow. And I, so I found out that I could take these apart, and I could take a little drop of oil and put it in there, and put it all back together. I could, you know, wash it out with carburetor spray and blow it dry real gently, and put a little drop of oil in there, so that little, uh, but it was always pointing up anyway, the oil would stay in there. And that little thing would be swimming in oil and would never give trouble again. But you had to know how to do it right because the needle would be pointing the wrong way if you're not careful. The speedometer wouldn't be right and all that kind of stuff. Fast cable spins, the higher the needle reads. See that little weak spring? It's working against that. All right, so magnetic gauges work this way. The variable voltage dash gauge got two magnetic coils that the battery voltage is applied to. And the coils act on the gauge pointer and pull the opposite direction. So basically, you can basically see how your tank attachment works as it goes up and down. More of the ground is going that way instead of that way. See? And that's going to make your needle, needle go this way and that. You'll have three wires, I mean, three terminals on one of these. Make sure you understand how that works, okay? Three terminals. All right, that's not too bad. And most of the gauges that you see, now there's all the instrument clusters up there on there. You can find those kind of gauges, like in that one right there. It's got them wires hanging off. Uh, I'm probably going to give you all a worksheet where you're going to work your way through all of those. And I'm also giving all those fuse panels over there. And I'm going to have, I'm going to unplug one of the relays. I'm going to say, I want you to find where this re pin is going through and coming out on the back. And you have like 100 terminals on the back of it. And you got to isolate which pin that is going through there. You should really enjoy that. See?
<laughs> all right, so modern day clusters. All right, so now you've got a computer built into the cluster. Your data link connector can talk to the cluster, and basically you've got all your sensors and everything, your switch, switches and sensors and all this, feeding input into this computer, a whole bunch of inputs. And what do you call it when you've got a whole bunch of inputs? Parallel interface. That's what that is, when you've got a whole bunch of wires. When if you've got one wire or two that's carrying a lot of data, giving you a lot of information, that's serial interface. You got it? You understand that? Parallel versus serial. The engine controller is basically got all of the stuff going into it, you know, your powers, your sensors, and all that's parallel. You know, if you know the old computer, there's no parallel point for your printer, you have like 25 pins in there, whatever it is, you know. All right, so, and then your, 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 your USB is a serial bus, it's only got two pins. It's got power and ground, and it's got two signal wires. You know, right, right. All right, film and rim. Some of the front and rear electronic control modules on some vehicles, well, this 2000 Windstar, the rim receives input from the fuel sender and forwards it to the cluster. If the sender fails, the needle stops wherever it was when it saw the last good reading. All right, how do I tell you to find out if it was out of gas? Let's say your gauge is reading three quarters of a tank, engine's dead. You suspect you may have a problem with the fuel pump or something. You check how many amps the fuel pump's pulling, you remember? Mm -hmm. What do you do? You go, you set your meter up to read amps. Remember, your, whenever you're reading amps, your meter becomes a jumper wire so you don't go from positive to ground like you two guys did when you burned up on my meter. Okay, so what you do is you actually feed the terminal. That's, you find the terminal that's leaving the relay, that's going to the fuel tank, and you get some power. You go through your meter to that terminal that's feeding the fuel pump. And if it's pulling one and a half amps, that means you're out of gas. No matter what the gauge is, you know, because it's supposed to be pulling from four to eight amps if it's pumping gas. Got it? You remember the internet? Okay. So, network driven cluster. This 2007 Cadillac Escalade cluster has got gauges of receiver input from the network. Uh, every needle is driven by the instrument cluster CPU. Notice the PCM receives sensor inputs and sends commands. <coughs> so, a lot of the times you can actually go in there with your scan tool and you can go into your, uh, your bi directional controls and you can tell it to you know, cycle the gauges, you can tell it to turn on warning chimes, you can tell it to turn on warning lights, and all that kind of stuff. Now, on your, uh, there was an electronics problem I ran into on a Jeep Cherokee that was like a 99 model, or, I'm sorry, Grand Cherokee model, and they said that the, uh, the high beam indicator was flashing what looked like a binary code. Like that. So I got into troubleshooting this, and I didn't see anything in the shop manual about it nowhere. I looked at the schematic, and I looked for any TSBs or anything like that, and so I called the uh, the hotline says, look, I don't see any information on this, but I'm seeing a binary code flashing on this thing, and the high beam indicator is the only thing that's doing it. And he goes, oh, that's probably, it's got to be an instrument cluster. It's under warranty anyway. I'll just you know, sign off and get you an instrument. $800 later, still doing the same thing. Well, it turned out the body computer, which is 125 bucks, was actually doing that. It had something screwed up inside of it. It was sending a signal. Well, what happens on that one, as I remember, you know, I've slept since then, whenever you're actually turning on the lights, and you operate the high beam, you know, to go for the high beam, it basically sends a signal down to that little box, and that little box down there says, okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn on the relays that are going to fire up the high beams, and I'm going to send a request to the instrument cluster, and I'm going to say, would you please turn on the high beam indicator for me? Well, in this particular case, it was in there going, da, 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 you know, just turning it off and on all that, you know. <coughs> so, anyway, there, you got to understand how this stuff works. Now that's basically what you're looking at there. See how this uh, uh, GM LAN low speed, that's local area network, the low speed serial data is talking to these. They typically use, your, use low speed serial data for gauges because it's not as critical as something like engine controls or ABS. ABS will use your high speed TN and all that kind of thing. And so notice the PCM receives the sensor inputs and sends the commands. See that? So it's basically talking back and forth between these two. You got boxes talking to each other. 97 Jeep Grand Cherokee, a network driven cluster. That's not a very good picture of it, but that's what it is. All right, see that? Same deal. See how, that, see how you got an airbag control module? It's got a twisted pair. It's actually talking over this CCD bus. Now, that is Chrysler. You know what CCD stands for? It's a very confusing term. It stands for Chrysler Collision Detection. That has nothing to do with having a crash. It has everything to do with this message is not running into each other when they're going over that bus. So they don't, want the, they don't want the messages colliding with each other. You know what I mean? We don't want any package crashing, man. You know what I'm talking? All right. So getting used to the concept of networking is part of the deal. All right? So it's the data link connector on the network, too. 2014 Buick Regal. Uh, notice the breathtaking detail here. Wow, that looks really complicated, doesn't it? See? Basically, you've got almost nothing you got going on now. 
you know, you got a little bike control module, you know, down here that's feeding some data up that way. You notice, now the GM, you see that little thing right there? That's a, that is basically a network, is what he's talking about. It's a network feed. Now, you can put a scope on there. You actually got a breakout box for the uh, data link connector out here. When you put the scope on it, you can see the data link. Now, you can't parse that except to tell that it actually is talking and all. But the scan tool can sort that mess out and throw you some you know, numbers. All right. Now, a hybrid electric cluster is not on a hybrid vehicle, just the cluster. Uh, Self-testing varies. Some gauges sweep when the vehicle turns on. How many of you have turned on a key and seen the gauges go all the way and then go back? That's basically, a, that's one that's got a computer in the dash. It's a back computer built into the instrument cluster, and that's how it basically does a full test. Some of them will light up all the segments on the odometer so with, eight, with eights and all that stuff all the way across, and then drop off. All right, so watch out for bulletin. When all the gauges have gone dark and no fuses are blown, look at that. Instrument panel cluster gauges in operative rope to reprogram IPC, Cadillac Escalade, so on and so forth. Comment on vehicle startup. All instrument gauges are in operative during a cold start. Low battery condition, low voltage condition may cause the gauges to freeze during crank cycle. Don't replace the cluster unless a pre-program pre is not collected. And I had a guy that was working at a, at a GM dealer in another town, and he said that uh, he went over there and uh, he replaced. I mean, he said six or seven mechanics had replaced clusters in some of these vehicles, and they hadn't been able to fix any of them. Well, they gave it to him. He came from here, you know, and. Uh, he said he checked all the fuses, didn't see anything, went to look up TSB and it said to reprogram, reflash, I think the engine controller is what the TSB said to do. So he got the tech two and reflash the engine controller, fixed his cluster. Didn't take 10 minutes. And the service manager says, I'm surprised that none of these other guys understood what you did about looking at TSBs, reflash the controller if that's what he's doing. Easy as pie, you know what I'm saying? But uh, if you replace the whole cluster, you're actually throwing money away because <laughs> that one was wrong. See, the engine controller was where the trouble was, it wasn't the cluster. Uh, and although sometimes you can unplug the battery for a while, you know, like overnight or touch the battery terminals together after you unplug them and you can fix something like that sometimes. Uh, speedometer tachometer might be an operator during the gauge needle being wrapped around the wrong side of the stop peg. You might see that going whoop, goes all the way around and sit the peg on the bottom. You ever see that? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, envoy that we got out there it does, right? it, it does that same thing. thing. With an ignition switch in the off position, press and hold the odometer reset button. Turn the ignition switch to the run position, continue keep holding it until the cluster needle start to move, then release it. Don't allow the ignition switch to enter the start position. The gauge needles will sweep in both directions and come to rest in the correct position. So you can actually fix that by just turning the key on and mashing it, you know, like they were talking about. Uh, now some of these Chevrolets, like a late 2000s model, you can order all of the stepper motors uh, it's a little kit. It costs about $36. And every stepper motor that goes in that instrument cluster, they'll send it to you. They send you solder. They send a solder sucker. They send a soldering iron. They send a little thing to pop the needles off. <laughs> it's kind of fun replacing all those cluster things that we've done a few of them here. Instead of replacing the instrument cluster, that's all you got to do is replace all of those little uh, things. And uh, you'll get a chance to do that too, so don't go to sleep on me. All right, so. That's, if you work all night and you come to school all day, you got to be a trooper. You know what I'm saying? So you be careful with that. All right, illumination has got to do, hey Tim, illumination has got to do with all of these uh, lights in the instrument cluster uh, that you have to do. And I had actually, uh, we, I've seen this. That little uh, way of doing that right there has been in place since 1968, I think. And I do not even know who this is. Let me see what's going on. Hey, this is Richard. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. I see what you want. Yeah. Well, what we need to do is get it up here so we can get it looked at and everything. We'll make you a work order and we see if we can work on it. Uh, about 10 minutes now. Uh, if you get here about 1 o'clock, I'll be here. Uh, if you get here between 12 and 1, I probably won't be. Yeah, be, 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 yeah, be, yeah, be here at 1. Yeah. All right? All right. I got so much work for y'all to do this afternoon. Y'all ain't going to believe it. All right. Anyway, these things right here, you basically got that bulb and a couple of ears right there, and they slide over this printed circuit. And the uh, first time I ever replaced the bulb like that, and I thought it was cool as I'll get out, was in the instrument cluster in a 69 Oldsmobile 98. 
I was really blown away. I said, wow, they don't even have wires going to this. You just pull a little thing out, put another, put a bulb in it, put another one back in there. All right, so uh, instruments were illuminated. and other cluster illumination, it can be dimmed. You're going to dim the cluster illumination. There's a way to do that right there. Now notice which food fuse fuses the cluster lamps here. The tail lamp fuse. So what happens is, if the tail lamp fuse blows, these lights go out. Okay? So that's an indication to you if those lights go out, you need to see if you got tail lights. So what can happen to you if you don't have tail lights? You get rid of Boom. Here's another thing. If the if the high mount stop light doesn't work, you got a 40% chance of being rear-ended. 40% more. So if you don't find somebody's high mount stop light and it was out, then it's 40% your fault they got rear-ended. Right? Do not miss that. I've actually come along behind students and say, hey, did you check the high mount stop light? Oh yeah, I checked it. Well you check it, it don't work. Really? You checked it? Seriously? Have you ever lied about that, something like that when you didn't want to go back and relook at it again? Y'all don't do that, do you? Nobody here's ever done that. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, here's the middle end. Look at this thing right here. A little bit more complicated with the electronics between the dimmer and bulb. All right. So, this is only in a, uh, like a 2003 Jeep Wrangler, if I remember right. It's one that I worked on. And see this little schematic right here that I have condensed down to one page? You know how many pages that's on in the Jeep shop manual? Seven pages. Seven pages. It goes from page to page to page to page. And you got to track all that crap down. I don't know who came up with those wire schematics. That's the stupidest fool thing I've ever seen. But anyway, whenever I got it sorted out in my mind, it comes from the ignition switch, through the instrument panel fuse 33, goes to the multifunction switch, then comes over here to the electromechanical instrument module, and it goes to the instrument panel switch and radio and all that kind of stuff. These lights go out. You know, see, you got your little dimmer input like that. Those lights will go out, and sometimes what will happen is well, this one right here that goes down to your Perndle indicator on your con if it shorts out, it will burn out the electronics in this. And you can actually bypass that and get those lights to come on all the time, but you can't dim or brighten them. And that instrument cluster is over six hundred dollars. So think about that. You know. All right, so anyway, a 98 Explorer is like a road map of Clarksburg. See that? That's that something else. Now, on a 98 Explorer, that little dimmer switch is actually going to feed it out on two different wires. See, your light blue red wire goes, and it usually feeds all of those, but on this one here, red black wire goes to some of them. So if you can sort out these wiring schematics, and you see that these lights are out, but those are working, then this little rascal here can be bad. I've actually had to replace some of them for that. Because this, these lights wouldn't work, and that would, like the radio and stuff wouldn't work, but the ashtray light did, and all this kind of stuff, and you thought they were on the same circuit, they come off two different wires. See? This is pulse width modulated output, and this is DC out. So when you turn on the key, these just come on. And you can dim and brighten those, but those are pretty much stay the same way. However, you know, that's a little transistor up in there, a little, you know, wheel you got on there. Now, you got a transistor. The transistor played the power and channel up to a mid-90s firebird from arrow is real similar to this. The dimmer switch, you know, the variable resistor feeds the transistor base with variable ground. It's the field effect transistor. And so the more, like if it's, a, if it's a PNP, the more ground you put in here, the more power it does flow across there. Well, whenever it's slowing some of that power down, that heat sink right there is necessary to keep that thing cool. You got it? And that's what a PNP is. See that? And you also got an NPN. Uh, so you got an emitter, collector, and a base. And so basically the more ground you put in, the more it goes across. And that's how you do that. These things burn out all the time on those little Camaro. You just have to swap out. Aggravate to get to All right, one size doesn't fit all. A lot of instrument systems are out there, and when they get in trouble, it's not wise to wing it. You gotta know how the one you're working on is wired, or you get the, you get it over your head really fast. Did you fix the lights on the Ranger? The rear end light? Yeah. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't fix the lights on the Ranger. What happened? Mm -hmm. Had to wing early. I thought you were working on that when I got here yesterday or something. The Dylan Oh, they fixed it. Okay, so they fixed. Oh, I can't believe it. Okay, all right. I fixed the rear end lights to the Crown Victoria. Line. All right, then. all right. There we go. So, what was wrong with this? The ones on the Crown Vic. What was wrong with them? Uh, the, the ground. It wasn't grounded to the grounded bolt. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the trunk underneath the mat. How in the world did that happen? Do you down. suppose? Someone tampered with it and didn't yeah. put it back. Yeah, that's what we do sometimes. Now, I will tell you this. When Adam is setting bugs, he sets bugs a little different than I do. Yeah, I noticed that. Adam is not bashful about going up in the harness and cutting the wire. 
<laughs> he will do that. He will go up in the wire harness and he'll take off the, the, the sheathing and he'll go snip and he'll tape it all back up so you won't ever know. You get me? Don't you just love that? Yeah. yeah it's crazy. I can tell yeah. someone yeah. with this on it because the ground. He'll flat sure do it. He hasn't done the Ranger yet. Huh? Yeah, he hasn't done the no, he didn't do the he didn't do the tail lights on the Ranger yet. And that one doesn't have a cut wire that. either. That's something oh, else wrong yeah. with that. I ain't got the tail on the Ranger. Huh? Y'all fix the tail lights on the Ranger. Yeah, that was cool. Well, and, but Michael didn't finish that, huh? Okay. Well, if if you don't if you don't finish, you guys know what happens when you don't finish one, right? The, the instructor goes back and puts a harder one on there that you had to go for, and that's your punishment for not fixing it the first time. You've got to do one that's a lot harder that you may never figure out, you know, even if you work on it two days, you have to work, work, work. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. You've seen that happen before, so. I mean, yeah. we narrowed it all down, so yeah. that one was fine. I was just looking like... When I looked at it, I figured it out, yeah. and then we had to let it yeah, I let her finish it because I didn't want to. Like I heard there. Yeah. The same time. Yeah, that well, that's like somebody, you know, taking the oil filter off that you couldn't move, and you say, "Well, I loosened it for you." Well, this uh, this one guy that the shop foreman. I used to keep the shop manuals updated, and you know, one of the things that I was doing the way that I got paid when I was working over there was I would actually get paid a, a different way from a lot of the other mechanics. And what I would always do was I would stay busy all the time, and so if if there wasn't any work that they had for me right at that moment. And every now and then you're going to have a little dab of dead time. What was I doing? Was I over the water fountain? Was I drinking coffee? No. What I was do? I was fixing battery chargers. I was blowing the dust out of computers. I was trying to make it better. I was updating shop manuals, which was a big job. And so one day, the shop foreman and this other guy was working on this Ford probe, and the, 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 something to do with the air conditioner wiring or something, it had them up against the wall, and it was wearing them out. Just beating them all up. I mean, they were just being smacked around. And uh, they said, you know, they said in the shop for me, you know, he's the one that talked like Slim Pickens. He comes, look, 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 look at this sucker. And I went over and I, look, and I looked at it and I says, let's get the wires come out. And I looked, and on the page they were looking at the wires come out, one of these orange stickers I put on there that says, go to this particular page and look at this updated. <laughs> really? I said, hang on just a minute. And I went over and I got the TSB book that had that wire schematic update in it and flipped to the right page. And I says, look. This is what the deal is. That's what's wrong. It took about 15 seconds when we got the right schematic. You get what I'm saying? So sometimes you're going to have a bad schematic, and you got to be smarter than the book. People like you, and I work with me and this one Richard in every mechanic shop.